Thank you very much. Can you can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. If, if the sound starts to go, just let me know, please. Okay. Wave your hands or whatever. Yeah. Um, hello from a uh, rainy Granada in southern Spain, and and thank you very much, James, for that very very kind and very generous introduction. Thank you also to Michael for all the technical support. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to be here with you virtually today. And, and to all the, the um, staff at the NIDA school for your comprehension and understanding of my uh, personal situation this week, which means it makes it impossible for me to be in Italy with you, which was, of course, my first intention. And I'm actually very sad not to be able to be there personally. So my apologies for that. I'm going to try to make up for it um, through technology for the three lectures and also for the tutorials. So the idea is that we should be able to hold individual tutorials, probably by Skype. I have sent Michael my Skype address. I think that's the easiest way to do it, but if not, we can, I'm sure, also find other ways. Um, I, when James very kindly invited me to participate in the, in the NIDA school, I proposed three topics, two of which are directly linked to translation pedagogy and the third a little bit indirectly linked to translation pedagogy. Um, the first two are about curricular design and about trainer profiles. So today I'm going to talk about curricular design for translator education or for translator training and Maybe we could have a short discussion about the terminological issue there. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to talk about who educates translators at university, who are the trainers, what is their typical profile, what should their typical profile be, and how we can help new trainers. And then on Friday, I'd like to move a little bit away from pedagogy directly to talk about an issue which has also been of great interest to me through my teaching, and that is the issue of directionality in translation, uh, whether or not translators work into what is normally called their mother tongue. And I'd like to problematize a little bit around that concept. And I think it's a concept which, which is in fact quite central to translator education, so it's not unlinked to the two previous lectures. And in fact, today we'll probably mention directionality in passing also. Um, why is translator education important within the field of translation studies? And why would a summer school of this kind be interested in translator education? I think it is, if, if we go right back to the famous map, uh, Holmes' famous map of the discipline and so on, interestingly enough, translation studies as a discipline has always had an interest in education and in training. Now, this is unlike other scientific or academic disciplines who have never really been necessarily very interested in the educational side of what they do. But of course, it is essential in translation studies because there is such a need for professionals that it is very, very important for us to understand how uh, young bilingual people become professional translators. And in the context of doctoral education and of a summer school of this kind, many of you will already be working or will be working in the future in an academic context, in a university, and many of you will already have been called upon or will be called upon in the future to teach translation. Now, I just wonder, could you raise your hands if that is the case, if you have already been teaching translation at any point? Yeah, so what 
well over half, if I can, I think, yeah. Um, so I think that would bear my, would um, confirm my argument that in fact it is important to be able to reflect on translator education, even if it is not necessarily our major field of specialization. Why curricular design? And just briefly, because people often say to me, but most people who work at universities don't ever actually participate in curricular design. Now that depends very much on the university system that each of us is working in. Um, some of us, of course, will be much more involved than others in the actual design of a curriculum. But what is very definitely the case is that anyone involved in education, anyone involved in teaching, needs to understand what has happened in the curricular design process in order to understand his or her role in teaching. Why am I teaching this? To whom? And so on. And that's a little bit what I'd like to run through today. Quite apart from that, Macro-curricular design, that is how we design full programs of study and so on, is one thing, and that's what I'm going to talk most about today. But almost all teachers at some point are involved in micro-design. Almost all teachers at some point are involved in designing their own syllabi, what they're going to do in class with their students, or they're involved at least partly in the design of activities and so on for the classroom. And that, of course, is simply this, a similar process, but at a, at a lower level, if you like, at a more micro level rather than the macro level. So almost anyone teaching needs awareness of and a, a competence in syllabus design, curricular design, and so on. So that is, is why I believe that, that this issue is, is important. I also think it gives us a good framework for any other discussions on other aspects of translator education. Now, I'm going to try to stick to my um, 60 minutes, of which I have already consumed quite a few, just with this general introduction. Um, so I'm going to sort of run through the general presentation if there is anything that is unclear, maybe in a classroom situation, in a physical presence classroom situation, I would normally say, just stop me. Um, it might be a little bit more difficult in this situation. Maybe if you just note down anything that you want to come back to, I will try to make sure that there is ample time at the end for, for debate. Um, Okay, much of what I'm going to say is based, logically, on what I have published on curricular design, um, mostly, but not exclusively, in the 2005 handbook, a handbook for, translation, tra for translator trainers, which has as its subtitle, A Guide to Reflective Practice. And I think that subtitle, which is very often not quoted or not referenced, is actually to me more important than the first half of the title, because to me, reflective practice is the essence of any teaching and learning activity. So, as I said, most of what I'm going to say is, is to be found in the handbook. I had sent as prior reading chapter two of the handbook. Um, I am aware, of course, at this point that the handbook is now 13 years old and that it is in need of some updating. Um, something which I would love to have time to do. Uh, people ask me quite often, are you not going to bring out an updated version of, of the handbook? Um, but as James said in his introduction, I have been devoted since 2008 to senior management at university and hence I'm afraid do not have as much time as I would like for my own writing and my own research. 
Um, but as I run through the presentation, there are perhaps some points which I will make um, where I would slightly modify what is actually in the book itself. Okay, I'm going to try now to share the screen with you. I'm, I hope this works. Are you, are you, can you hear me okay? Is everything okay? Yep. yep. Yeah? I've great. Mic on. We can hear you great. Let okay. me know if the share screen doesn't work. Let's try the share screen. I'm sure it'll work. Is that okay? Uh, we see it. Looks great. You can see it? Okay, right. So this is my university. Maybe I should present my university to you also. Um, the University of Granada, not quite as old as our uh, fellow Spanish university, the University of Salamanca, which is this year celebrating its eighth centenary, but we are almost 500 years old. And we are also, and this is perhaps important, one of the first two universities in Spain to set up a, translating, a translator trainer program. Uh, which is in fact the reason that I'm in Spain, because as James said, I was I had my own education in Scotland, uh, in Edinburgh, um, and then partly in Switzerland and partly in Spain. Uh, but I was asked to come to Granada as a very young graduate to join the teaching body at a time when the School of Translating and Interpreting was just being set up at the university. So um, Granada then has a close link to translating and interpreting since the late 1970s. And I have myself participated in the evolution of the school and, and hence in fact my interest in translator education, in curricular design and so on, because it's a process I have been through many times myself at my own university. Okay, so the full heading would be a systematic approach to designing curricula for university translator education programs. Important perhaps here to comment on a couple of things. The systematic approach is something that universities are not always very good at. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. The second is that I am going to center almost exclusively on programs at universities, which does not mean that I am not aware that there's an awful lot of other translator education that goes on out there. Um, in two main sectors, one would be that of professional associations and the other would be that of major language service providers. So on the job training, on the one hand, continuous professional development, mostly on the other. But I'm looking here really at the more initial translator education programs, whether they be at undergraduate or at postgraduate level. Okay. That summary is, has come out a little bit small, but never mind. What am I going to look at? I'm going to look a little bit at the various different steps involved in a systematic approach to curricular design. And then I'm going to look at some of the aspects of the process in particular context, objectives, and I'm going to talk there about translator competence, student profile, alignment, which is a, a very important issue in curricular design, and briefly about resources. But before I do that, maybe I should just tell you a little bit about the gentleman whose statue you have on the screen. And what I'm trying to do here is bring the city of Granada also into this presentation. Um, the gentleman you have on the screen is Yudaben Saud Ibn Tibon who is a 12th century Jewish translator who was born in Granada and who worked in the fields of medicine, philosophy, and poetry, and was, was responsible for a great deal of translation work done in the Middle Ages. You'll be aware that in the Middle Ages in Spain, a lot of translation work helped to bring 
um, knowledge developed in the Arab speaking, Arabic speaking world into the uh, into Europe, um, and was thus very very important in the transmission of knowledge at that at that period in history. So we have a statue to this translator in the city, and I think it's uh, it's always nice for those of us who work in translation to be familiar with the various uh, schools of translation from around the world. Moving on, here we have a representation of the curricular design process, which as I said, I'm going to run through briefly at the beginning before going back to go into some detail on a couple of the essential steps in a curricular design process. Um, the process is represented here in a very linear format, although the process itself is not a linear process. It, it is a much more recursive process in reality. But here, for reasons of uh, simplicity of presentation, I'm going to go through it step by step, um, rather than present it in, in its full complexity. So let's have a look how, perhaps before we actually start with step number one, we should say that this entire process takes part, takes place in a complex social context. And that that complex social context to which I will in fact move forward briefly, um, conditions the entire process. And it conditions the entire process in various different ways. And I'll just mention a few of them here before I go back to look at the process itself. So it is not the same for us to design a curriculum for Spain, which is where I have mostly worked, as it would be for you to design a curriculum for Italy, for China, for the US, for the UK, for Poland, for Turkey, and so on. Because, although there is, of course, a great temptation uh, to look for universals and for sort of one size fits all, education in particular is very, very culture bound. And so it's impossible for us to look at de designing a curriculum without bearing in mind things like academic tradition and culture. Um, and maybe just a couple of examples there. Academic tradition and culture. Different systems have different kinds of universities. Different systems have different teaching and learning styles. And I think one of the um, one of the situations in which I learned most about the difference between teaching and learning styles was in my fairly early days as a young lecturer in, in Spain, coming from the UK, a UK context, where on the whole teaching and learning is very inductive. In Spain, teaching and learning is very deductive. That is, one starts with the theory and works towards the practice. In the UK, we would start with the practice and work towards the generalization and, and the theory. Um, but this, of course, has a very, very strong impact on teaching and learning styles. Spain, because it is very deductive in its approach, would be very transmissionist, if I can use the term, which, of course, our colleague Don Kirrelly will, will use normally to criticize academic traditions in many, many parts of the world. And I can still remember very, very clearly, one day in class, a student asked a question, and I said, very, very naturally, I don't know. There was total and utter silence in the room. Now, it's very hard for me in this technological situation to know whether there's any silence in your room or not, because I can't really hear very much. But I can assure you that the deathly silence that, that, that followed my I don't know 
is something that will remain with me always uh, in my teaching experience. Because of course I had broken the, uh, the absolute golden rule that the teacher has to know everything. The teacher has to have an answer to everything. Um, and so I was going very much against the academic culture of, of that classroom. Something um, which I continue to do, but which I now do consciously. Now I know what the impact will be if I say I don't know, and I know why I'm saying it and how to say it. But that first impression was very, very important. Now, when we're designing a curriculum, we need to bear in mind these, these kinds of teaching and learning styles and so on. We also need to bear in mind the, the general education system. Um, what do our students learn in secondary education? And again, here an example from translator education. In most parts of Europe, translator education includes two foreign languages and would start from a fairly high level of proficiency in those two foreign languages. Um, but in many, many countries, and include, I'm including here Spain, that is simply not possible because secondary education does not reach a high level of proficiency in more than one foreign language. And we could perhaps question also the level of proficiency in that one foreign language. But certainly, we need to adapt our curricular design to what our students know when they come from secondary education. Similarly, we need to adapt our curricular design to what other university degrees exist. Um, apologies for the extra I in the existing there. Um, are there language and literature degrees? Are there applied languages degrees? Um, what does translator education coexist with it at the same level of education? Now, this also has a strong impact on our curricular design. If we think, for example, of a situation where there are only very, very traditional language and literature degrees and translation degrees. What happens there? And that is what happens in Spain uh, which is the country I will take many of my examples from. Um, because there is nothing in between, anyone who wants to work in modern languages and cultures, but not in a traditional way, will very often end up studying, translating and interpreting, although they do not necessarily want to be professional translators or interpreters. Um, if we don't take this into account in our curricular design, we can come up against all sorts of dissatisfaction, lack of motivation, and so on, which is a big problem in any, in any educational context. On the other hand, if there is a broad range of, on offer, then translating, translating and interpreting courses can probably afford to be much more specialized in nature. Then something which is closely linked to the last point in the education system, the level of university autonomy, linking into legislation and regulations. Um, in many, many contexts, universities are pretty free to design their own programs, to look for their own staff, basically to do their own thing. In other systems, however, there are national regulations, there is national legislation about just about everything. Now, the degree of autonomy that we have will, of course, have a very, very strong impact on how we can work, how we can set up a program, what we can put in that program, and how we can resource that program. And that brings us on to resources. The social and institutional context in which we are working will, of course, be highly influenced by the economic situation, the financial situation, the resources available, and so on. So context is really, really important. And just a, a 
further comment on context there. Um, James very kindly mentioned in his introduction that I was involved in the European Masters in Translation expert group. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit of the history behind that expert group, perhaps so that you can understand just how important social and institutional context is in curricular design. In 2006, the European Commission was very, very worried about the quality of its new translators. And this mostly arose from the difficulty they had in finding well-qualified professional translators after the enlargement of the European Union in 2004, which you will remember was a very, very substantial enlargement of the European Union. Uh, which went from 12 members at the time to the current 28 in a couple of stages, but, but there was a big jump in, in the mid, sorry, from 15 at the time uh, to today's 28. So a huge enlargement and a huge enlargement also in terms of the number of languages which the European Commission had to work with. And they had pretty serious difficulties finding translators to cover all the language combinations. And so in 2006, they decided that they really needed to do something about this, that they couldn't simply sit back and hope that universities would produce the kind of translators they were looking for. So they called a conference in 2006 of universities with translation programs all over Europe. And they presented us with a model curriculum. They said, look, we're not happy with these translators that we are finding on the market. And we have decided that we're going to tell you how to go about training translators, the translators that we need. And they presented us with a model curriculum which was based essentially on content. So all translators should study international relations. All translators should study terminology. All translators should study X, Y, Z. As you can imagine, it did not go down particularly well with academics and universities to be told, well, this is what you should be doing. And so we basically, we said to them, look, this curriculum might work in one country, in one situation. It might work as a master's program in a country where uh, language skills are strong, where you have a lot of graduates of this kind and the other kind. But it certainly will not work in other countries. It certainly will not work in countries which have very strong undergraduate programs in translation, for example. And quite apart from that, you seem to have forgotten that the European Commission is supporting the Bologna process, which was a very important reform of university systems, where there is a strong move away from content-based curricular design to competence-based curricular design. And they were very taken aback because they had seriously believed that their one-size-fits-all universal model curriculum was going to work for everyone. Um, but they, they listened, which is good, and they set up an expert group where eight of us from various different parts of Europe and various different academic traditions, but all involved in translator education, worked together with the Commission and with the professionals working at the Commission for over two years to come up with an approach to curricular design which could help universities to move forward and help the European Commission to find the kind of graduates they were looking for. Um, and the results of, of that um, particular experience, I think, are, are very, very interesting. And I'll come back to them when we speak about translator competence. But simply to say that we really do need to take into account the social and institutional context we're working in, 
before we attempt in any way to design a curriculum. That said, how, what do we, what do we do? And the first thing we do is we need to decide what the actual social needs that we are um, providing for are. Universities are very, very often accused of living in an ivory tower, of ignoring social reality, of ignoring the real world, an expression I don't like at all because I believe universities form part of the real world. Um, but very often that is because curricular design has been based on internal needs of the university, internal needs of academics, and not on what society itself needs. Now, a few words about what I mean by society. Um, a very, very general uh, understanding of social needs in the world of translation is that we are talking about what the language service providers want, what the big employers want. And of course it is true that we need to bear in mind what the market wants and we need to bear in mind what the large employers need. But I think we need not to lose track of the fact that universities have a broader social mission and therefore uh, translation translator programs at universities do not simply have the role of producing what industry wants today because of course by the time our graduates have come through our programs industry will want something else in any case um, so we're, i think we're talking here about looking at the market looking at society in general and also attempting to look at needs in a few years time. And that's very, very complicated today. And it almost inevitably moves us away from some traditional approaches to curricular design. 30, 40 years ago, we could imagine that someone leaving university was going to work more or less in the same sector and more or less in the same job for much of their professional life and was perhaps not really going to need an awful lot of extra professional development. Now, of course, that is very, very, very far from true today, where if we attempt to describe now what the translation profession is going to be like, even in five years time, it is almost impossible for us to do that because the rate of change, the speed of change, the depth and the breadth of change is so strong because of technology that it is very, very, very difficult for us to do that. And so the role of the university also changes and the university no longer transmits knowledge but rather helps young people to learn, to learn, to adapt, to change, and to manage information. And that is something that we very clearly must factor into in curricular design that we are doing today. Once we have identified the needs that we wish to attend, um, then we have to move on to formulating the outcomes of our training program in more detail. In order to attend those social needs, we need to achieve this. We need our graduates to be able to know how to do this. This in most terminology in translator education research today is expressed in terms of translator competence. And I will come back a little bit later on to one model of translator competence. There are many out there and I'll say a few words about those a little bit later on. 
once we have formulated what our outcomes are to be, then we need to go way back to the beginning of the process and we, we need to look at who our students are. In order to get from A to B, it's not sufficient just to know what B is all about. We need to have a good look at A. Who are the people that we are to help to learn, that we are to accompany towards these outcomes over a two-year master's program, over a three-year undergraduate program, over a, under a three plus two, a five-year integrated program, whatever our context allows us or tells us to do. And of course there, there are all sorts of elements that we need to look at and which I'll come back to a little bit later on. Once we've identified student profile and their needs, we need to look at the content of the program. That is, how are we going to structure the program in order to take our students from A to B in a logical progression, in a logical fashion? What elements do they need to learn? What elements of declarative knowledge? What more procedural abilities do they need to develop? What critical um, approaches do they need to develop and how do we do that? And then we need to move on to what do we need as universities, as institutions, as schools, in order to be able to do all of this? What resources do we need? Uh, now, resources of all kinds, uh, but I'll just perhaps mention two. Um, quite apart from computers, quite apart from libraries, quite apart from software and so on. I will mention two because they concern me more than the others. The first is learning spaces. And I'm looking at a very small little inset of, of your classroom. And I'm just wondering, would that be a good learning space for a translator education program? What do we require of a learning space? Are we looking for an interactive learning space? Are we looking for a learning space where students can simply sit and listen? Do we want our students to work in groups? How do we want them to work and so on? So we need to ensure that we have learning spaces which are appropriate for the learning, proce the learning processes we want to set in place. And the other major resource which worries me a great deal and which we're going to speak a lot more about on Thursday is that of translator trainers. Is that of having the right people with the right knowledge and the right profile to accompany our students as they move from being young students right the way through their learning process to becoming pre-professional, early professionals um, and of course this is a profession in itself and, and that is perhaps what I'm going to insist on most on Thursday um, that being a translator educator being a translator trainer is in itself a profession has its own professional profile very complex professional profile and is in fact one of the major problems which universities face when they're designing their curricula and they're designing their programs. Um, if we just, if I can just give you a quick example, if we think that in China in the past 10 years, over 270 universities have set up programs in translating and interpreting. And if we think that each of those programs probably needs an average of somewhere between 20 and 30 qualified members of staff. We are talking about a huge number of highly qualified people needed 
very urgently in a very, very short space of time. So that is very definitely one of the issues that universities should deal with when they're designing their curricula. Although I think perhaps many of us know that it doesn't always happen that way. And that very often we find ourselves in a situation where we are setting up a translation program because well, we're not attracting the students to the traditional language and literature programs. We have the staff, they're permanent staff, they have tenure, so we need to give them work. So how do we give them work? We invent a new program, something else. And, and we end up with all sorts of dysfunctionalities, uh, which it is very, very hard to remedy. At this stage in the curricular design, process we move a little bit down down the scale to a little, slightly more micro approach and there we need to look at designing activities for teaching and learning now this is one of the things which i would change if i were to rewrite my handbook and that is that this separation between teaching and learning activities and assessment which you see here is something that I would no longer formulate in those terms. I would very definitely bring together teaching, learning, and assessment. The design of all those activities should be done at the same time. Um, thinking of assessment, of course, in terms of the three major functions of assessment, because assessment essentially should be a tool for learning. Mm -hmm. And as such, we have, as I said, the three functions. The first, the diagnostic function, so needs analysis, where we assess what our students know when we are starting to work with them. Then we have formative assessment, so feedback on learning as we move through the learning process. And then, the summative function of assessment, which is the one that everybody thinks about, that is grades, examinations, accreditations, and so on. But really, the most important thing about assessment in the curricular design is that it should be helping learning. And so I would, in any new version of this, link teaching, learning, and assessment together. Designing the activities will, of course, depend very much on our context and will depend very much on the academic culture and teaching and learning styles, which are typical and um, consolidated in, in our context. Um, but on the whole, we need to make sure that they are activities which will ensure learning, and this is, is very important, the learning side should take precedence over the teaching side. Our aim is for the students to learn. That said, and, and we, can, we can look at all sorts of examples of, of um, teaching and learning activities at a very micro level, but also at a very macro level, simulating translation agencies and so on and so forth. These need to be coordinated across the program and they need to be well thought out for the whole program. And just very quickly to conclude this second slide before I, I move on to, to translator competence and student profile, um, it is essential when we're designing any educational program that we should also design the evaluation of that program. Um, programs should never be designed as a static phenomenon, but rather as something that needs to be constantly enhanced and constantly improving. And hence, we need to know how we're going to detect what's working well, how we're going to detect what is not working quite so well, and how we can um, improve that. Having designed that evaluation process, we, we then move on to the implementation of the whole program. We start our program and we move into quality enhancement mode. So we are constantly looking at, does this work? 
Are these the students we expected? Do we have the staff we need? Are our learning spaces appropriate? And so on. And we, and this is the essentially recursive part of the whole process, we then see what is not working and we change. So we change the design of our activities. We change the um, admissions procedures so that the students are um, better suited to the program. We change our assessment procedures. We change the order in which we do things because we discover that things are not working and so on and so forth. So a dynamic process. I think that it's very, very important to insist on the dynamic nature of, of this process. And now I'm going to, let me see, just very, very quickly run through that um, identifying social needs step to say where do we find out what society needs, where do we find out what the market needs if we're sitting at a desk designing a program. The market is probably the easier side to discover, not necessarily the easier side to attend or to satisfy. Um, but I think it is very important for us to remember that what the market requires is not only a case of what the language service providers say, but also we need to look at demand in the sector and there will be demand in the sector which is not necessarily covered by current language service providers. A very interesting case in point here would be that of community translating and interpreting, public service translating and interpreting, uh, which is a very, very strong social need and yet doesn't normally appear very high on, in the priorities of language service providers and other, and other employers. But we also need to look at the profession itself. So not the market, not the industry, but the actual professionals. Um, what professional associations are, are telling us is needed um, and what our graduates are telling us is needed. Someone once said to me, but that's exactly the same as asking the employers. I, well, actually, I don't think it is, because if you ask the employers, for example, about translation memory and the use of other um, computer assisted translation tools, they will tell you they need one thing. Very often that recent graduates should be very well versed in the use of one major tool, whereas graduates themselves professionals themselves will tell you, yes, of course, you need to know how to use it, but it's not just a case of the practicality of using it. You need to know how to incorporate it into your workflow and perhaps more importantly, into your finances. And you need to be able to defend yourself um, when employers try to tell you that they're not going to pay you full rate for fuzzy matches and so on and so forth, okay? That would be one side of our social and market needs. The other is, is the much more general social mission of the university and, and this is something which I um, believe is very, very important. And that is what does society expect graduates to be able to do in general, graduates at different levels. Each society will have an understanding of what a bachelor is able to do, of what a master's graduate is able to do, and what a doctoral graduate is able to do. In some situations, we are fortunate enough to have documents which actually make this explicit. In others, it is not quite so explicit. Um, I was, for example, very interested to hear when I was recently in China that the committee which set up the BTI, the Bachelors in Translating and Interpreting, and the MTI, the Masters in Translating and Interpreting, is thinking of setting up a doctorate in translating and interpreting, but a professional doctorate. 
that is they are not assuming that this doctorate would be a PhD, it would not be a research doctorate. So clearly there is a different societal understanding of what a doctoral graduate is in China with regard to what we would have perhaps in Europe. In Europe, we have um, documents which give us the general profiles of graduates, which are, this document is known as the Dublin Descriptors, and I know that in other parts of the world there are similar descriptions. Uh, saying, okay, this is a BA program, so we would expect the person to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, two other very important issues. I'm going to skip over the other existing degree programs. I'm going to look at the need for universities to help to facilitate the development of critical and reflective citizens. And if I were to define one major mission of the university today, I think that would be it. Almost independently of disciplines and independently of what each faculty, what each program is intending to do. The university must be a place where young people and not so young people, because of course now there, there is widening access to universities around the world, become critical, engaged and reflective citizens. Um, and that of course is very closely linked to the need for continuous lifelong learning because the society in which we are living is changing so fast, is moving forward at a pace which is totally unprecedented in, in the history of, of humankind. Lifelong learning, the ability to learn, is also something that we need to bear in mind. That said, sorry, I'm going, I'm going the wrong way. My apologies. Okay, that said, I would like to move on to learning outcomes and given the time that we have left, I would like to discuss learning outcomes for any translator education program in terms of translator competence. That is, any program designed to educate future professional translators needs to have as its outcomes within the overall outcomes of, you, of what a university is, so critical, reflective, engaged citizens, able to learn during the rest of their lives, able to adapt and so on. In particular, in the field of translation, professional translators must be able to do, to carry out, to know a series of elements. This has been described by different authors and different groups of uh, researchers over the years as translator competence. And what I'm going to run through today is my own model of translator competence, which you have in the 2005 handbook and which was first uh, published in 1999. It is based on observation of the professional world. And it is also based on a fairly thorough review of the literature existing at the time within the discipline. It's, it was also designed for the purpose of developing curricula and syllabi. So this does not purport to be a model of actual professional activity, but rather is a model which helps us to understand which competences students need to develop in order to become fully professional interpreters, uh, sorry, translators or interpreters, but this is designed really for translation. Now, the model, as I said, is based on a lot of work which had already been done in the field. And one of the models it is 
closest to is the model designed by the PACTE research group at the University, the Autonomous University of Barcelona. But it does have important differences with the PACTE model, which I will explain perhaps at certain points in the development of the model. Now, again, here, this is simply a list of elements. Now, the model is not intended to be simply a list of elements, and I think this is very important. One of the things which distinguishes translator competence um, from other professions which have similar uh, areas of competence is precisely the combination. And one of the most important things about the various areas of competence here is that they are all interrelated. And I would visualize this as a sort of a pyramid where the first six elements form a hexagonal base and the seventh element, the strategic competence of the translator, is somewhere up above that base and is the one which helps translators to bring the other elements into play at different points in time. Now, my colleague Don Kiraly will always say, but there's no such thing as a perfectly symmetrical element in nature. And of course, he is absolutely right. Models are symmetric. Models are um, geometrically uh, perfect. But real life is not. And the important thing to realize here is that for each person, but even further than that, for each translation commission carried out by each person, the pyramid will have a different shape. Okay, now I'll, I'll perhaps come back to that a little bit later on so that it's a little bit clearer. But let's just run through, what does a translator need to know or to be able to do in order to be a competent professional? Um, the first one is, to me, perhaps the very, very self-evident, but that does not mean, of course, that it shouldn't be there. And the first is that translators should have communicative and textual competence. Now, this is what Pacte calls bilingual competence. Uh, but to my mind, the translator does not work with language as such. That is, does not work with language systems, but rather works with communication and text. So we don't translate language, we translate text. Um, and so what the translator needs to be competent in is communication and producing and understanding texts in particular communicative situations. In, of course, at least two languages because in translation, we always have two languages present. Um, and of course, those, com those communicative instances and those texts will be produced also in a cultural context, which brings us on to the second element, that is the translator needs to be competent in his or her areas of culture, but in particular needs to be competent in intercultural communication. That is, needs to be able to identify where there are differences which may make communication more complicated, where there is a need for intervention in that intercultural communicative event. The third area, and I'm running through this quite quickly, is subject area competence and this would bring us I suppose to the eternal debate of whether or not it is better to have a, a medical doctor who happens to know languages carrying out a translation or whether it is better to have a professional translator who is sufficiently versed in uh, medical sciences to carry out a, a medical translation. A translator clearly needs to have some knowledge of the subject matter that they are working with. 
at least sufficient to understand what they do not understand and bring into play their instrumental competences in order to solve those issues. Uh, and this is one of the, the areas perhaps where we will most notice uh, a change if a translator is working in an area with which he or she is very familiar or an area with which he or she is not so familiar, that, pyram that pyramid will change shape. When the translator is not familiar with the subject area, or even when the translator is familiar with the subject area, um, but it is a complex text or there is something new in, in the text that they need to deal with, they need to bring into play their professional and instrumental competence, which is actually a very multifaceted area of competence, where we have all the translation tools, right from documentary research, information mining, through terminology, through computer assisted translation tools, right the way down to knowledge of the market, knowledge of um, professional practice, and so on. A particularly important area today, I think, in the light of technological developments and so on. And of course, um, important here is the whole area and the whole issue of ethics and ethical approaches to the profession and to professional activity. Moving on to two areas which don't always appear in competence models, but which I think are, are important. The first, the psychophysiological or attitudinal uh, area. It is very, very interesting when we look at research into directionality of translation, that we actually discover that one of the major differences is a difference in competence. Uh, sorry, in confidence, in self-confidence um, of the translator in their ability to carry out the task. And this confidence or lack of confidence has an impact on the success of the actual translation process. Uh, so these are the, the areas that would come into the psychophysiological um, area of competence, ability to concentrate, confidence, what Kirali calls the translator's self-concept, knowing oneself to be a translator. Uh, so socialization into the profession, which again is an important area here for translator education programs. And the sixth point on the hexagon, on the base, is interpersonal competence. To my knowledge, um, this was not in any other model of translation competence on, until 1999. It does now appear in a couple of other models, in particular in, in the European Masters for Translation model. I remember, and I always, I always comment on this when I, when I discuss interpersonal competence for translation. When I started as a first year student on an undergraduate program in translation in Edinburgh, one of the first things we were told was, if you're an, ex if you're an extrovert, if you like being with people and you like talking to people, then you want to be an interpreter. Whereas if you are shy and retiring and like to work on your own, surrounded by books and dictionaries, then you will want to be a translator. And of course, this, is one of the, this was one of the givens of our two professions for, for a very long time. But when I started to work on this model, and started to think a little bit more about that, I looked at simultaneous interpreting booths. And I thought, okay, so we have simultaneous interpreters locked up in a booth where really they're not talking 
to anyone. They're not interacting with anyone except perhaps their booth partner. Whereas, if you look at what a professional translator does today, you will discover that they are constantly in contact with clients, with other translators, with terminologists, with documentary specialists, with end users, and, and so on and so forth. So I felt it was extremely unfair um, and extremely stereotypical, but unfortunately, inaccurately stereotypical, to think of the translator as a loner. Um, and, and the interpersonal competence of the translator, I think, is something that is, that is important. So we, I brought this into the model as the sixth point on the hexagon. And then all of these areas of competence are governed by what I have termed, as Pacte also terms it, strategic competence which is the ability to bring each of these different areas into play as they are needed to identify resources which we need in order to complement um, what we are doing at any given point in time. Um, and basically to organize, to organize the expertise. Now, this is in no way intended to be and very much less so in the very, very brief description that I have just given you, an exhaustive list. Rather, it is an, a series of areas of competence where the translator needs to develop and to become proficient in order to bring together this very, very, very complex set of abilities to undertake what is a very, very complex task at professional level. Now, how can this be organized in a curriculum? Unfortunately, at universities, very often there is a tendency to say, okay, so we need courses in language, we need courses in culture, we need courses in the subject areas, we need courses in the instrumental abilities, and everything becomes very, very compartmentalized thus making it very, very hard for apprentice translators to understand the interrelated nature of all of these areas of competence. So I would say the most important thing here is to look at where our students are starting from, look at where we want to take them and find ways of combining the different areas of competence in a very, very coordinated, and very aligned fashion. So it, we're not talking about setting up a module on interpersonal competence, I think as, just as an example of, of what I'm trying to explain there. I'm gonna skip over generic competences, except to say that one of the very interesting things about translator competence is that a lot of the elements of translator competence tie in very, very well with what employers are looking for in general as transferable skills, generic competences, soft skills, they are sometimes called, it's not a term I like, um, for employment in general. Now this makes it very, very interesting from the perspective of those programs where a lot of students matriculated are not really 100% interested in becoming fully professional translators, but rather understand that translation is an interdisciplinary, uh, open, modern approach to their university education, but really in the end, they're quite happy to end up working somewhere else. Now that very, very happy coincidence of translator competence with generic competence means that we can in fact work very well with that sort of approach for our students, as long as our students are aware of that, which is one of the other problems, of course, that we very often have. A few brief words because I, I don't want to speak for much longer on student profile. 
Um, when we're talking about student profile, I think we're talking about three major areas. The first is prior knowledge. That is, what do our students know when they join us? And how much control do we have over that knowledge? That is, do we have an entrance exam, for example, or do we not? In many contexts, selection is not possible. In many European countries, for example, students completing secondary education are entitled simply to move on to university. So prior knowledge is something which we need to identify. If we can control it, it makes life much easier for the curricular designer and for the teachers. But if we can't, we need to be able to typify it. We need to understand how to do diagnostic assessment and how to adapt our teaching and learning situations to a diversity of students. This is perhaps also particularly important in a changing world where higher education has become increasingly international and where previously universities were used to receiving students from a very local catchment area. Now, many of them are receiving students from all over the world. And of course, the prior knowledge of students coming from one continent is not the same as those coming from another. Two other areas that we need to be familiar with in order to make sure that our curricular design is going to be feasible and is going to work are what are our students' expectations with regard to what we're going to do during the program and how we can help them to ensure that their expectations are not too far away from what we actually have on offer. And then what are their motivations? Um, if we have a classroom, as would very often be the case at my faculty, if we have a classroom with 30 students, 20 of whom have chosen to study translating and interpreting because they see it as a modern approach to modern languages. They see it as perhaps something linked to the glamour of travel and, and interculturality. Two or three of them are in the classroom because they are very, very good students and there is always pressure on good students to join programs which are competitive. And the rest of them really want to be professional translators, we need to be aware of those different motivations if we are not to alienate one part of the classroom as we attend the other. So again, attention to diversity in this aspect of what we're doing. Brief words on program structure content, where the key words would be coordination. Um, Many, many universities suffer from highly compartmentalized programs where there is very little coordination amongst the teaching staff and the students are the only ones who actually know what's happening right across the board. And that, of course, is not a very good way of putting together a coherent program for them. Integration amongst the different areas of competence that is, let us not only speak about terminology in a module about terminology, let us ensure that the application of terminology management to practical translation comes up constantly in our translation programs, uh, translation modules. Transparency, do students know what we're doing and why we are doing it? Thinking again of those critical and reflective citizens that we want them to become. Um, we need to encourage them to know what they're doing and why they are doing it. Sequencing is another major issue in program structure. And this is very interesting because, of course, it is also culture dependent. Now, if I were to think of a design of a program in translator education in a very, very deductive culture, such as the Spanish culture, 
then we might think of having translation theory in first or second year program. Whereas in a much more inductive context, we would probably leave the theoretical courses for the end of the program, by which time students have enough practical experience of translation to be able to reach and to understand theoretical approaches. And again, this is a case of academic culture. I won't go into units or modules at this point. Resources I have already spoken, I think, briefly about. Uh, just run through them again. Financial resources, of course, are important, but they're not everything. They're not everything. The physical environment and the learning spaces in which our program is going to be administered is essential, is essential. Our technical and support resources, so what libraries do we have, what IT do we have, what software are we going to be able to use in classrooms and so on. And a brief word here about um, what was fashionable not very long ago, and that was teaching translation in the computer room, where you have a whole lot of um, uh, PCs with the towers and so on and so forth in a very, very unfriendly environment. And there has been a very, very welcome move well away from that now to a much more open learning environment where students can see each other, where they can move around, where they can speak to each other, um, mostly using laptops, uh, but also using other forms of, um, of technology. The human resources I have mentioned already, and I will, as I said, speak a lot more about on Thursday. And then management teams, an important resource, uh, leadership, leadership coordination, a team of people who have a very clear vision of where the program should be going, what the program's aims are, and who help to pull together the, the team the human resources working working on the program. So those are all the various issues which need to be taken into account as we try to align and coordinate our teaching and learning activities with our intended learning outcomes, our teaching and learning activities with our student profile, and our assessment activities with our intended learning outcomes. So it's a big complicated jigsaw that we have here. And I will not, I will not complicate it even further with program evaluation at this point. I think I'll stop there because I calculate I've been speaking for at least 60 minutes um, and we are running out of time. So thank you very much. I'm going to close this part with, um, a photograph from the rectorate building of my university, which is a 16th century hospital. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Kelly. <laughs> okay, um, I, will you, I will roll around with the microphone, and uh, for those of you, I'll now look to you. Uh, if you have comments, questions, and you need to move the microphone for Dorothy to hear you.